Well, hi everyone, and thanks, Silva, for your great introduction. Uh, it's really an honor to be here to talk about the GFR Lab's work. Uh, as you mentioned, OSINT is a very diverse field, and what we do at the GFR Lab is many things. We're an organization that is within an, an American NGO, and we work on counter disinformation, but we also work on, a various, on various topics. So I'll just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Valentin Châtelet. I am a research associate in security for the DL for the DFR lab. And uh, today we'll be talking about what we do in geographic intelligence, how we monitor war areas, how we monitor areas of conflict, how we monitor uh, the what is happening on the ground in areas where you have arm trades, where you have humanitarian crisis or war crimes happening. Um, and just a quick disclaimer whilst I'm at it, uh, this presentation will contain footage that comes from war areas, as I said, so there is the footage of explosion, footage that comes from war areas, including uh, humanitarian crisis, and this might be triggering to, triggering to some people in the, across the audience, so if you feel at some point that you have to take a step back and walk out of this room, it's totally okay, and you can join back at any point. Um, and yeah, so this presentation will mostly be focused on uh, Ukraine, security theme topics revolving around Ukraine, um, and I've put up a very comprehensive outline of what we'll be covering today. So I'll talk briefly about the DFR Lab, but before I do that, can I have a show of hands? Raise your hand if you know the DFR Lab, if you've heard about them. Okay, not so many people. Um, so I'll briefly introduce us, and then I'll talk about our work in geographic intelligence, the work that we do uh, in Ukraine, how we've been documenting the war for uh, since the beginning in 2022 and the seven years prior to that. And I'll also talk about some research angles, how you can use geospatial intelligence to enhance your data and to uh, monitor some other phenomenon. So the DFR Lab is essentially a research center which is within the Atlantic Council of the United States. And we are around 30 experts that are uh, spread around 30, uh, five continents. And we work on areas of the world that we specialize in. So my specialty is Russia, Eurasia, the Baltics. But I have colleagues who work out of uh, or out of South, South Africa or uh, somewhere else in Europe, in Georgia, Poland, or also Latin America. We also have people who cover uh, Chinese disinformation. And uh, we are one of the main NGOs which essentially focuses on countering disinformation. We produce very extensive reports on that. We monitor telegram channels. and. Um, we also have a capacity building program. So the DFR Lab has this very cool thing which is called the Digital Sherlocks, which is a free training program that happens over the course of three months and we cover everything about OSINT. We cover OPSEX, introduction to R, we cover uh, monitoring uh, social media, geolocation and satellite imagery, which are the sessions that I animate personally. And we are a team of people who come from various fields, from journalism, we have former diplomats, we have former journalists. I am a former uh, software developer in GIS. So all of these know-hows interact to sort of build up a very extensive picture of how we can use OSINT to monitor what's happening uh, in conflict areas in my area. And on that note, we've released one report, actually two reports back in February 2023. The first one is Narrative Warfare, which was coordinated, coordinated by my colleague at, uh, in, in Riga, Nika Alexeyeva. And we're talking about the seven years prior to the invasion of Ukraine, how Russia created narratives that would be justifying its casus belli, how it um, created narratives that would tailor to, to its domestic audience uh, to make them accept and uh, sort of tweak narratives uh, that would depict Ukrainians as Nazis or, or stuff like that. And we based this report out of 10,000 articles that we got from EU versus Disinfo, and we monitored all of what they said before the, the war began. And after that, we released an other report, which is Undermining Ukraine, which is work that was conducted by my colleague in Kyiv, Roman Nasatchuk. And this report focuses on um, essentially the narratives that Russia has been deploying abroad uh, in the international audience, and it targeted France as well, and I guess in the light of what Viginim has been uh, releasing in their uh, report of the RN uh, disinformation campaign. Uh, this is something that speaks to the French as well. We've been monitoring what they did also in Latin America and across Africa in order to undermine support for Ukraine and to uh, influence policymakers. And if you are if you don't want to read really the reports but you do speak French, we actually release a podcast on that with Le Collimateur and I invite you guys to uh, listen to that if you have time. 
Our work is very extensive, and we've also just released another report on disinformation landscape in West Africa. And we release pieces on a monthly basis on um, telegram channels that are spreading disinformation. And we also monitor elections and disinformation in elections. But you guys didn't come for that. You're, you came from GEO, and so this is what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the time I have here. So open source data is something that is very interesting when you have to monitor war areas. And in the events that were leading up to the war in Ukraine, we started to monitor what was ha happening on social media and which type of footage was being posted there. And the first thing we saw, and this is research that was conducted by Michael Sheldon, who was one of our former researchers who now, who now works for Bellingcat. And we started to see these huge deployments of tanks, of military equipment, of helicopters that were targeting not only uh, the oblasts or the regions that are bordering with Ukraine, but also Belarus due to exercises. So the, the, uh, the gif of, of the tweet that you have on the right hand side is actually a military exercise that was happening two weeks before the invasion in Belarus, so that is the north of the border with Ukraine. And we started to see even more uh, equipment that was being deployed to the neighboring regions of Ukraine, so the Belgorod region. And we started to see things that would not be part of exercises. We started to see military radars. We started to see S-300 missile systems, attack helicopters, as I've mentioned as well, and T-80 uh, T tanks as well. So we compiled all of this data, which located all of this data. And this is one week before the, the invasion. We have an actual map of all the fronts that were surrounding Ukraine before it got invaded on February 24, 2022. Um, so this is something that is instrumental and shows how ge ge geolocation and uh, geographic intelligence is instrumental in understanding how uh, this conflict broke out. And at the same time, we were monitoring information in the uh, information space. So these are two video excerpts that are taken from Telegram. And this video belong, these videos belong to the so-called heads of the self proclaimed republics of Luhansk and Donetsk. So on the left, you have Denis Pushirin. And on the right, you have Leonid Pasichnik. And what was very interesting is that these videos were released on February 18th. And they were saying that they were starting an evacuation of the Donbass of the civilian population because the Ukrainians were allegedly shelling and bombing the area. They were also releasing, fo releasing fo false narratives saying that there were Polish battalions trying to blow up chlorine tanks and make dirty bombs. But the thing is, since these videos are on Telegram, if you look at the metadata, this video was actually shot two days before it got released. So this was not an emergency situation. It was something that was coordinated by the Kremlin. And this is research that was conducted on Twitter by Ari Toller. And when the war broke out, we started monitoring the civilian areas that got shelled by, uh, by Russia. And what we pulled up was this uh, extensive map of all the different points within the city of Kharkiv, which is next to the border with, uh, with Russia in Ukraine. And we started to see that you, uh, Russia was undifferentiably shelling areas that were civilian areas, civilian infrastructure. And this is research that was conducted by uh, Michael Sheldon and Lucas Andriukaitis, who is working at the College of Europe and also teaching about geolocation and geographic intelligence. And by we identified these locations just by looking at social media information. So this is information taken from uh, Truja, which was a, a Telegram channel that was posting all of the information of footage that was uh, presented and showed the areas that Russia was shelling. And we identified several locations across uh, the city of Kharkiv. Now, um, there is a fourth caption here, but I've removed it because there is a picture of that corpse. So if you want to look at the entire piece and what we've put up in this research, uh, just be advised that there are going to be images of corpses as well. So uh, this shows the location of residential areas that have been shelled by Russia. And by cross-referencing this data with other data that was posted as well on Telegram, we saw that Russia was also shelling uh, civilian infrastructure, so factories, railways, uh, and well, I guess you guys all he have all heard about the uh, rupture of the, the dam in Ukraine, which was also ultimately uh, the result of Russia's conduct and the aggression. And using satellite imagery, we were able to retrieve the locations from which Russia had been shelling Ukraine. So this is an image that was taken from planet.com. So planet.com is essentially a, a private satellite imagery provider. And the resolution is not very high. So if you use Sentinel-2 imagery, for instance, this is, this is some, something that is very similar. Um, and what we saw was that we were able to find locations where we saw plumes of smoke 
We saw areas that would likely be firing positions and were located near Russian bases. So the shelling of the city of Kharkiv actually happened from uh, areas that were located within Russia. And this is something that we can reconstruct just looking at the angle at which the shell uh, destroyed the building. And all of this evidence showed that Russia was shelling Ukraine territory from its position before the invasion. So this is all very interesting and it's, it, I'm showing you fancy maps and infographics and stuff, but the core of the work is, is a bit tedious. Uh, and I wanted to just take a step back and uh, talk about how we geolocate work on a daily basis. So we started working on areas of war crimes. So war crimes here include the civilian areas that have been shelled and should not be shelled because they are not of military interest. And we collected pictures from Telegram from the Ukrainian state emergency from the city of Zaporizhia, which is in Western Ukraine in the Dnipro River. And on March 2, there was a, a shelling which resulted in the destruction of an entire compound which was inhabited only by civilians. And I think this is a very interesting case of geolocation because we also pulled data that was coming from night footage that was posted within the replies of the original tweet by the Kiev Independent. So just to give you an understanding of what we're starting from, we're having the picture on the left, which is what is left of the building, and we have to find this building in the city. And what we have on the right is CCTV footage from the night where the shelling happened. And this is very interesting because we are able to actually find a time code that is showing us at what time the attack began. And it's also footage that is taken from uh, the cityscape. So it shows us also the direction of the explosion. Um, and this information can be cross-referenced with other reports on Telegram that say that shelling is happening in the city. So we have a span of time that we can focus on and that will tell us uh, at what time the shelling happened. Now, finding the actual place where the CCTV footage was taken is actually fairly easy. If you Google CCTV footage uh, Zaporizhia, you will be prompted with the first result, which is this uh, CCTV camera on the bottom right-hand side of this, of this slide, which already tells us where it is located in, in Zaporizhia. So this is the festival square, and you can already, I think, make out the building that we saw in the previous piece of footage. So we can find the tower that I highlighted in the, CC in the night CCTV footage and the square that was where the CCTV footage that I pulled from Google was showing. And if you don't believe me, you have here the CCTV footage plus the footage that we uh, got from, from Google and a Google Street View view of the, of the streets. So we're already having a, a place to start working from. And by just looking at this uh, area from Google Earth, what we saw was that uh, we were able to determine a radius of impact that was the area that Russia was, Russia was selling, shelling, sorry. And you can make out all of the details. You can see the tower that I already talked about before. And what is interesting is that we also have the position of the radio tower. So we cannot infer internationality behind uh, the, the attack. We cannot say Russia wanted to shell this radio tower and it by accident shelled a civil uh, residential area. But what it tells us is that Russia has been undifferentiably uh, shelling both areas. So this is just a warm up of how we can do location on a day-to-day -day basis. Now we are working with other organizations which are also monitoring what is happening in Ukraine and uh, looking to um, find people to take them accountable and to then bring them to trial. And this, usually when we conduct this kind of geolocation work, we share, th we share it with uh, GeoConfirm, which is one of the biggest projects of geolocation on the war in Ukraine. And yeah, this is one first step, and I think anyone in this room would be able to open up Google Maps or Google Earth and try to assess where this happened. So I wanted to talk about another way we can use geographic data because geolocation is fun, but it's not actually using geographic data. It's uh, more like using, um, well, one of this, this online game where you have to find the position of, of where you are on the surface of the, of the Earth. I can't remember the name of the game for some reason. Uh, and what I wanted to demonstrate is how you can use geographic data to tell a story. And I have two cases on that. The first case is on the Belarusian Russian air drills of 2022 and 2023. So Russia and Belarus have been cooperating in their air power. So Russia had been relocating aircraft to Belarus for some time. And Belarus, I think we have to remember, was one of the first fronts to open to invade Ukraine and to invade Kyiv. But after the December counteroffensive by Ukrainians, well, the city was 
again under Ukraine control, and there was allegedly nothing happening on the northern front. And this is actually an assessment that is not true, because if you look at uh, what is happening at the border, uh, you have posters that are standing on either side of the border. You have a poster that is on the left-hand side, on the Ukrainian side, and is facing Belarus, but says, together we vanquished fascism, and together we will vanquish Russism, so Russia. And, well, the Ukrainians also showcased this, uh, this video where they planted the Belarusian partisan flag on their side of the border. Now, there were also armed buildups, and we started to see that Belarus was uh, planting more um, dragon teeth, which are this um, sort of these fences that prevent tanks from uh, getting into the roads. And this is 20 miles away from the Ukraine border, so this is a defensive buildup that indicates that there is low intensity conflict and there is, from Belarus' perspective, a risk of invasion. And on the aerial side, we saw that Belarus was collaborating with Russia using military aircraft and they were flying together over the Baltic Sea. So the video that you have on the right-hand side here has been taken from Twitter, and it's a video that shows a Belarusian military cargo aircraft, which is escorted by Russian Suhoi fighters, and they're flying together over the Baltic Sea. And this footage was taken because the NATO interception mission in the Baltic States intercepted these aircrafts. And what this tells us is that Belarus and Russia have been collaborating for a long time to put pressure on the airspaces of allied countries of NATO, but also in the, against Ukraine. So uh, this is information that was taken, again, from Telegram, but from a monitoring project that is called Belaruski Hayun, which is sort of a, the reference project whenever you, wor you work on monitoring what is happening in Belarus. And the uh, screen capture on the right-hand side is showing the deployment of S-300 missiles, of panzers, and uh, of other uh, military radars that are located 80 miles away from the border with Ukraine. And what we also see is that on the left-hand side you have a video that was taken by BIPOL, which is essentially a partisan organization that is made of former law enforcement agents of Belarus, and they conducted a sabotage attack where they used a drone to uh, use C4 to damage an aircraft. And the aircraft that damaged is actually an AWOCS aircraft. It's called an A50 BDF, and it's an aircraft which is used in um, monitoring areas, in radio, radio signals, mapping areas, without actually get to, getting into enemy territory. So needless to say that the, the situation at the border with Belarus was actually pretty tense. And just mapping the extent of what the S-300 missiles would be able to reach uh, we see that Kyiv was always constantly under risk of being attacked and of being shelled by these missiles which were located in a country that is allegedly not taking part in the, the conflict. Another way to measure uh, the potential of threat that Belarus was posing to Ukraine was actually looking at data from Telegram. So what we did was we collected data from uh, Belarus Kihayun, which was showing every time a Russian fighter jet was taking off from a Belarusian uh, air base, and we have to keep in mind this is a very important event because these uh, fighter jets are often equipped with hypersonic missiles that can reach Kiev within seconds. And we cross-referenced this data with data from uh, Air Alert Ukraine, which is a telegram channel that shows uh, when air alerts are triggered, so that is when uh, air alerts are telling civilians to seek shelter because of an imminent threat. And by cross-referencing this, we saw that throughout the entire year of 2022, plus the beginning of 2023 up until April, uh, Belarus has been keeping the pressure on every single northern region of Ukraine by uh, harboring these aircrafts and allowing them to fly in the inner air space. All right, now I have a question for you guys. How many Russian soldiers do you think have died since the beginning of the war? Does anyone have an estimate? Come on. Right. Not a happy crowd. <laughs> no one has any idea. Yeah. 200,000? Nah, uh, that's a bit much. <laughs> any other estimates? 30,000. That's close, but it's actually close. Well, we don't have the actual number of how many Russian fighters died since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. But what we can do is look at data, at OSINT data, that would tell us uh, which soldiers have died, and we can compile this in a very big data set, which is what the BBC and Mediazona are doing. And they've confirmed that there were around 25,000 losses 
on the Russian side. Now, we cannot confirm this number, and, and usually these estimates are way under the actual figure because, well, the Russian MOD has been lying for a year. The last estimate by the defense minister, Sergei Shaigu, is saying that there are less than 6,000 deaths in the Russian ranks, which is, well, an utter lie, of course. And you have Yevgeny Prigozhin saying, well, we have 100,000 losses in Wagner, but no one is actually able to verify this data. So using OSINT data is a good way to document that. And what we did was we collected data from a Telegram channel called Nizhdi Minya Iz Ukraine. Uh, don't wait for me if don't wait for me from Ukraine, which posts data of uh, Russian fatalities. So I had to blur out their faces because we don't do doxing and because out of respect for these dead people. Um, and the Telegram channel posted messages with their pictures, with their names, with uh, their birth birthplaces and their birth dates. And this is information that is available in the thousands. We have 23,000 messages from this Telegram channel that we can sort, uh, sort through and we can assess how many Russian soldiers died and where they were working in. So we essentially have this workflow where on the one hand, we wanted to collect this data and understand how many Russian soldiers had died, uh, where they were working, were they um, working for regular Russian armed forces? Were they working for private military companies? Or did they were, they, were they volunteers or, or anything else? And we used their birthplaces to map this data onto the, uh, the map of the Russian Federation to see which regions of Russia would have been most impacted by uh, the fatalities of the war. So after sorting all of this data, oh, by the way, this piece has just been released on our, on our website, on dflab.org. So if you want to check it out, it's just gone, down, gone live now. Uh, but since you're here, I can give you a preview of that. So what we were able to do after we sorted through this data was that we confirmed 90,377 fatalities on this Telegram channel, and we confirmed 4,000 fatalities amongst Wagner. Wagner itself is very, diff very tricky to understand how many fatalities they actually have, because if you look at Wagner data, well, they're not going to say that uh, this soldier has died. They're going to put them in a mass burial site. They're going to put them and bury them in secret. And we have to rely on the initiative of volunteers who have to go to these cemeteries, take pictures, and post that to the channel to actually confirm this person had died. And then knowing whether or not this person was working for Wagner or not is always very tricky. Now, I want to highlight that this 4,000 figure is 10 times higher than one the BBC or Mediazona have been able to confirm. Um, out of the regular Russian armed forces, we only have 14,000 uh, fatalities, which is already a big number. And we have 542 unidentified people. Uh, we also have figures on the convicted, uh, on the convicts that took part of, in PMC Wagner. So these are people who were in prison, usually for life or for a very long period of time. And the uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin himself went to prisons and asked these people, do you want to fight in Ukraine? And in exchange for that, you can be pardoned. And this is data that we have on these people. We have 116 people, convicts, that were fighting with Wagner who have died in Ukraine. Now, the data that is in this Telegram channel is just very extensive. So uh, what we did was we started to create categories because some of the messages we had, actually around 4,000 messages, contained information on the military rank of these people. So whether they were captains, lieutenants, whether they were serving uh, as pilots or in the ground forces. And aggregating all of this data, we were able to have our own assessment of which forces within the Russian Federation have had died since the war in Ukraine. And what is, I think, striking is that junior officers, which are lieutenants, captains, senior lieutenants, are the biggest figure of, of fatalities in this data set. This means that commanders, the ground forces, are likely uh, the part of the Russian army which has suffered the most since the beginning of the war. And then we have surgeons, and we also have data on generals. We have seven general officers whose deaths has been confirmed. And this is very important data because you have to keep in mind that general officers are people very high up in the chain of command, and it's very difficult to find a replacement for them. So the war for Russia has been very difficult, and it's probably given a very big blow to its, uh, to its armed forces. Now, onto the geographic data. What we did was we extracted the data that was contained within the messages. And I've mentioned that at the very beginning of this case, where I talked about the uh, birthplaces. So what we did was we split the content of the message, we got the birthplace, and we used a Python algorithm to query an API, which is Nominatim. Nominatim is the 
geocoder of uh, OpenStreetMap. Now, geocoding sounds very fancy, but it's if you've ever opened your phone and typed in an address on Google Maps, well, you've congratulations, you've just used geocoding, essentially. It's transforming uh, any kind of text information into GPS data. And by outputting the 20,000 something messages to this API, we came up with this enormous data set with data points that were all pointing within the Russian regions. And we were able to geolocate these reports over time. So after sorting through thousands and thousands of messages, but we have this, this very big map of all the different regions of Russia, where 13,194 uh, messages show that there has been deaths within the Russian army and the regions where these people are from. So a quick fact about that is that, well, this is only half as many data points as what we have originally. And one of the explanations for that is, well, Nominatim is a free API. So there are things, there are villages it's not able to find. And sometimes the data that we have in the Telegram messages is also incomplete. So we cannot input, output that into this map. But we were able to map this data to Russian regions. And I just want to take a step back to explain the technique that we use, which is very easy. So I've taken this from a manual, which is called Hands-On Data Visualization. And what we have is essentially a point map of hospitals within uh, across the US. And what they were able to do is transform this map into a corporate map, a map that essentially gives us a color scale of which regions have higher density of hospitals and which regions doesn't have uh, as many hospitals. And the, um, the science behind it is very easy to understand. You just have to think of a polygon and dots in a polygon and you count as many dots in there and this is the value of your polygon. And we repeat this operation on all the different polygons. So in this case, the polygons are the US states, but we did that with the, uh, the, the Russian map. So we came up with this uh, interactive map that is also available in the piece if you want to read it, that uh, tells us which region of Russia have been affected the most by uh, the fatalities in the war in Ukraine. And what was striking is what, even though the data on Telegram is not verified by a third party, the top 10 regions that we found were all the same regions that the BBC and Medizona confirmed. Out of independent data, we had the same conclusions, not the same order of magnitudes, but also the same results. So this is how geo-intent geographic data can be useful if you want to tell a story with data and you have bulks of it. But I guess some of you guys came to see some, fun, some fancy satellite imagery, so we're gonna talk about that now. Um, one of the very interesting things that I've started looking into ever since actually monitoring the war in Ukraine is electromagnetic magnetic interferences on uh, satellite imagery. So this is a technique that was popularized by Oli Ballinger, who is a professor of geocomputational sciences, and he's based out of London. And he essentially showed that you can aggregate satellite imagery on very long periods of time, but show interference patterns where there are uh, military radars. So let's just take a, t a step back here. Um, when you watch a satellite imagery, you usually expect something to be in colors, or you expect something that you will recognize as the different, I don't know, the forest or the mountains. Satellite imagery that is radar imagery is a bit different because we're using sensors that only detect radar. So what we have is we're eliminating the surface of the Earth with what we're seeing on the ground, which might be metal objects or might be military equipment as it so happens. And what is very interesting is that the Sentinel-1 satellite is operating within the five gigahertz band. And the five gigahertz band is the band in which the NATO radars are operating as well. So the map that you have on the right hand side is a map of the entire locations of uh, the military radars of Sweden. And Using that, we've been able to monitor the activity that was happening in the conflict in Ukraine. So it's something that is getting uh, traction right now with researchers and Brady Afric, for instance, has been uh, monitoring that. So I don't think you can see it pretty well on this, on this map, but there is actually very small uh, dotted lines of uh, pink interference at the border between Russia and Ukraine. And we can play with exposure, we can play with delays. So if we monitor the area for a very long time, we actually might be able to see a lot of interferences so this is what we did in a piece that dates back April uh, 21. And by monitoring just these uh, radar interferences over the Azov Sea between Russia and Ukraine, we were able to see that Russia had been revamping all of its uh, military defensive buildups. 
that it was likely sending more ships and that it was conducting more aerial uh, raids in the area. And another way you can use that, which is not by um, sort of delaying the exposure and getting data from, a, from different days, is looking at it punctually. So this is image that comes from Sentinel-1, which is completely free to use, and this is from May 18th. And by looking at the time code at which these pictures were taken and looking at the reports online, we actually were able to, to see that this is interference is, that is caused because of a Russian aircraft that is bombing Ukraine right now. So you can see the war play out just by looking at satellite imagery and watching for the interferences. Another thing we can do using satellite imagery that is free to use, using satellite imagery for instance, is using um, digital elevation models. So digital elevation models is um, a type of satellite imagery that is a picture which is in black and white, where white pixel would show the elevation uh, above the above ground or above sea level. And what we did was we used this uh, satellite imagery of a digital animation elevation model to monitor the um, consequences of the explosion of the dam in Ukraine in Novokakhovka, which happened very, at the very beginning of June. And what you see is that we have the original image, and then we we're able to use an algorithm which is called raster calculation, which will only isolate the pixels which are one meter above sea level and two meters above sea level, which is here in red. And all of that showed us how consistent these locations were with another project, a Russian project, which was monitoring which areas were uh, inundated as, re as a result of the explosion of the dam. So this is, this is just data that you can collect and it's pretty uh, accurate. All right, well, so the next question is where, where can I learn all these skills? Because I'm not an expert in geo or I'm not an expert in GIS, and I don't want to be spending hours just watching tutorials. Um, so I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do just a bit of self-PR here because uh, we actually have trainings on geolocation, on satellite imagery, on satellite imagery analysis for the Digital Sherlock's program. And this is just free to use. It is for journalists, it's for people working in NCOs. It's for anyone who is interested in our research. And well, it's just free to use. So if you wanna enroll, you can always do that. Um, and that's it for the satellite imagery, essentially. Uh, I wanted to showcase more of the additional research that we do because I'm probably the only person at the DFO lab who does a lot of geographic intelligence analysis or who conducts satellite, satellite imagery monitoring. So we've released some other pieces which tell stories about the war in uh, what we can see using OSINT techniques. So one of the first pieces I actually worked on for the DFO lab was the fact that uh, the Russian Federation was using the equivalent of Le Bon Coin in France or uh, of Indeed to recruit soldiers to fight in Ukraine. So if you open the equivalent of, of Russian Le Bon Coin, you would have this uh, job posters where you paid 244,000 rubles to fight in Ukraine. And this is actually data which is very interesting because it's posted out of a platform which is called Superjob. And Superjob is like Indeed. But what we saw was that this data was actually collected from the actual website of the Ministry of Defense in Russia. So that's a very grim uh, conclusion, I guess. Um, Russia also created thousands of websites for regions to incite people to enroll as contract soldiers. And they even placed ads in newspapers uh, where they also advertised the fact that you could get rewards. So if you've destroyed pieces of equipment that would be like, I don't know, HIMARS, well, you would get uh, a reward of around 1,000 rubles. All right, that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'm all ears. All right, does anybody have any questions we're looking for microphones right now? Yeah. What do you mean moving? Oh, yeah. So you if you look at radar imagery and you look at the uh, military radars, these are static radars, so what you could see is interference patterns that cross over each other, and that would tell us the location of where this, uh, this uh, military radar is located. 
But you also have, in some instances, for example, if you monitor aircraft or if you monitor ships, uh, you would be able to see uh, different types of interferences that show where this is located as well. And this is why SAR imagery is also very used in this field because you're more likely to detect any kind of military equipment but wouldn't be able to see on other type of satellite imagery. There is a mo sorry. If you have questions, no? I have the microphones for the questions. <laughs> oh, yep. Thank you. So I have a, a small question. Yeah, I was a bit late on the presentation, so I apologize if you've already mentioned it and I've missed it. But uh, I see a lot of satellite imagery, and I have that more often in OSINT course, courses like this is how you handle satellite imagery. But how does a, a, a non-government affi affiliated person get a hold of meaningful satellite imagery that's not just Google Maps from three years ago? Um, well, there are a few free satellite imagery providers that can be used in OSINT research. And I've mentioned Sentinel a couple, a couple times, but Sentinel is very good. I mean, it has low resolution, but if you're monitoring air bases, if you're monitoring compounds, you might see evolution that is happening within weeks or months, and this is imagery that is very frequently updated. So the data is very fresh, as opposed to what Google Maps or Google Earth will be releasing. So I would probably resort to that. But uh, as I mentioned, we also have access to planet imagery, which is commercial and paid imagery. Uh, now the resolution is not that high, so if you want to get very high resolution Im imagery and you can pay for it, you should probably use Airbus defense imagery or something like that. And SAR imagery is also another way to uh, monitor these things. There are a shit ton of company which are selling satellite imagery that is radar imagery, which is a lot easier uh, to interpret because they're not subjected to like things like weather. And what you can see is the location of compounds, because they are highlighted in the picture. And these are usually paid imagery providers, but uh, what you can do if you're a journalist, for, inst for instance, you can reach out by email and say, hey, I'm looking in this area right now and I'm worried there's something happening. Could you could give me a shot of this picture at this date? And m more often than not, they actually send you the picture. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for your presentation. How many source of uh, satellite uh, opens uh, how many source mm -hmm. of open source uh, satellite imagery do you have access to? How many exist? Oh, that's a very tricky question. Um, well, as many as various satellites send people who allow you to access their imagery for free. So, well, there is the European Space Agency with Sentinel. There is also the NASA. NASA has very good satellite imagery, which is not high resolution, but it's very frequently updated. You have FIRMS, which is a project that monitors the heat signatures on the surface of the Earth, so you can detect fires, for instance. Um, and yeah, there's a ton of them. So what I do is not only use satellite imagery, but uh, other kind of projects, but also use mapping data. So if you have access, for example, to open infrastructure, which is the, uh, well, an open project which shows, which shows all the power lines, that is also something that you can use in your research. And well, Google is not per se, um, I would say, an open source satellite imagery provider, but the, the imagery is here for free for you to use. So all of the map services that you can have access to, which also provide satellite imagery, could also fit into that category. So that would be Google, Bing, Yandex, uh, Baidu, well, you know the drill. <laughs> One more question. Yeah. How long did it take to confirm those 19,000 deaths? Oh, um, it took a while. Uh, I, the IED started in January of, uh, of this year. And well, essentially, the most of the time we spent was just sorting and filtering the data. So give, getting rid of messages which were not reporting on deaths, because the, the channel also contained information on prisoners, war prisoners. And also excluding all of the messages which would not contain any information on the birthplaces. So th that would be. I say weak work if you do that every day, but yeah, but it's not it's not that complicated. Same thing with the geolocation of his of his deaths. It's something that is very easy to do because well, the API is just outputting with the coordinates, and you just have to use that afterwards. But yeah, I said a weak work would be a worth a, a fair assessment. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, so, so during the presentation, presentation you were mentioning confirmed death uh, of, of soldiers uh, from Wagner, from the uh -huh. regular militia. Um, do you have an estimate of unconfirmed deaths as well, or do you really focus on verified data and uh, accessible from your Telegram channels, for example? Uh, I only focus on data that was confirmed. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, well, there's a lot of unidentified people in the data that we called, but this is data that we use still in the graphs that I presented. Um, yeah, for unconfirmed deaths, there are quite a bit of them, but I wouldn't be able to give an assessment. Some people might say the U.S. Uh, intelligence says around 100,000. It might be less than that, might be more. Wouldn't be able to tell. There is more question. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate also to pay beers to the speakers. <laughs> it's very important. They, they give a lot of Buy free time. alcohol, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Also, to grab more intelligence. <laughs> no? Nobody? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Valentin. Thank you so much, guys.